What's going on, everybody? Seismic PE prep, example problem number eight coming at you. Let's dive right in. The structures shown are located in a high seismic area, each with an importance factor of 1.0. During an earthquake, they will drift equally, i.e. the elastic displacement are the same. So displacement one is equal to displacement two. Displacement one is the displacement of building one, displacement two of building two. Over on the right, up above me, you can see our little figure here of building one and building two. Both are 50 feet tall. Building one is 20 feet wide, building two 15 feet wide. That doesn't really have anything to do with today's problem, but they give you that criteria because we always need to remember, they try to trip you up a little bit to make sure you, you really have things solidified. So PE is classically over gives you information so that you have the skill to sift through all that info on each problem and say, this is the stuff I need. This is the stuff I don't need and move on from there. Building one, the uh, vertical lateral system is a special concrete shear walls. It's a bearing wall system. And then building two, special concrete shear walls as well, except it is a frame system. You might be saying, I don't understand. Isn't that the same vertical lateral system? Well, no. Uh, in chapter 12, they have two different design parameters for a bearing system versus a frame system. High level, a bearing wall system is where, uh, as it sounds, your shear wall also acts as a bearing wall and takes on gravity load as opposed to a shear wall frame system is you have the shear wall for lateral load but it's designed such that there is basically a frame almost around the perimeter of the shear wall so if there ever was any destruction uh, of that shear wall as it's under load resisting the earthquake, there wouldn't be a total collapse and failure of your gravity system. So it's two separate things that that's as far as I'll take it today. If you're curious, I would dive in. There's some great forums on it that uh, describe the differences between both. Based on this information, the minimum required separation between the buildings is what? Well, we know from real life footage, as well as you know the movies, if you're not a structural engineer, that when an earthquake happens, buildings jiggle and they shake around and they displace. Well, when you have something like a city where you have two mid-rise structures that we'll call here today, they can displace quite a bit, especially as you get taller and taller buildings, they can move more and more because they're so tall and slender. You don't want two adjacent buildings ever moving towards one another during a seismic event and touching one another, causing damage to one another and potentially compromising each building's vertical lateral and gravity systems and causing failure of both structures. So engineers have put in code requirements specifically for here today, we'll be diving into the ASCE 716 to determine how far off buildings need to be separated from one another to avoid any type of collision. As promised, open up your ASCE 716 and head to chapter 12, because this is a, um, a seismic design for building structures. So chapter 12 is gonna be your bread and butter. You're gonna to head to 1212, like you can see here, drift and deformation. Specifically, as you scroll down in this section, you will see, let's see, gonna go pen here, 1223, structural separation, ding, ding, ding. Be grabbing onto those key words within the uh, problem statement. You can use those to do, you know, control F and find through the electronic documentation in the computer-based format exam. So structural separation, that was a great keyword that can send you right here. Separation shall allow for the maximum inelastic response displacement, uh, displacement some M. I'm sorry, I'm not a Greek philosopher. I can't remember what this, the hell this thing is called. So displacement sub M shall be determined at critical lo uh, locations with consideration for translational and torsional displacements of the structure, including torsional amplifications where applicable using the following equations. That is a lot of jargon that talks about your analysis in um, prior portions of this chapter when you're going through and actually designing the structure. You're not gonna be doing any of that here today. You got six minutes to bust this out and get moving on. Using the following equation to solve for our inelastic displacement. That gives you this guy right here. We have C sub D, which is your uh, deflection amplification factor. We'll talk about that here in a moment. You have uh, displacement sub max, which is your elastic elastic displacement at the critical location. That was actually some criteria specified to us in the problem statement, all divided by your importance factor for earthquakes, which is I sub E. Today, we know for both structures was 1.0.
So we're missing our C sub D factor. But where do we go and get that? That's actually going to be at the beginning of chapter 12, based on the vertical lateral system that you have in your structure. Let's head over there. But before we go there, this equation only gives you your inelastic displacement. It didn't say anything about your structural separation. You skip over this table, which is allowable drift, and head to actually the next page. I know we're just scrolling down here, but the physical copy, you actually move to the next page. Adjacent structures on the same property, we for today, I noticed that they didn't specify this, um, but we are going to assume that both structures are on the same property, and that does make a difference. Shall be separated by at least uh, displacement sub mt determined as follows. And here's your, your final equation that you'll need. So you'll need your uh, inelastic displacement for building one and your inelastic displacement for building two in order to get your structural separation, which is your final uh, answer. Now let's head back to that table that I was referring to in order to get our C sub D because that's, that's the starting point of this whole thing. We all know this. This is like a critical table, especially for these little five minute questions. They're going to be pulling a lot of context from this table to make sure that you as an engineer understand all of this stuff and how to apply it to that, those high level calculations and those little six minute problems. So be very familiar with this specifically, not for today's example, but be familiar with all of the footnotes down here. Very, very important. They can get a lot of gotchas for these small PE related problems. Building one is a bearing wall, special reinforced concrete shear wall system. Bearing wall, first one, special reinforced concrete shear walls, response of R over strength two and a half, deflection amplification C sub D, that's what we're looking for, of five. Uh, building two, same thing. It was a special reinforced concrete shear wall, except it was a building frame system. So as you can see down here, we have a whole different category. And within it, you think of frames, you think of steel frames, stuff like that. But they do have the same special reinforced shear walls, ordinary uh, reinforced shear walls. So intermediate precast. So there's, there's still solid walls that are in these frame systems, which can sound kind of counterintuitive. An R of six, that's the interesting thing. It actually gives you a higher response modification coefficient, which means you can scale down your seismic design forces more if you were to go with a frame system. Interesting, interesting. So if you're curious, hmm, maybe, we do, maybe we do a video. Maybe I talk about it. Let me know in the comments down below. Overstring factor remains the same. And your C sub D that we're looking for. Hey, we got a new subscriber while recording. Peace. Thanks, man. C sub D of five. That was so loud in my headphones too. It scared, scared the shit out of me. Both C sub Ds are five. So everything remains the same between these two systems besides your response modification coefficient R. With all of our information extracted from the ACE7, take a moment here, pause, make sure you're caught up and everything is digesting well. But let's move on. And I'm actually going to work backwards from the final solution to figure out what we need to plug in for. So displace it, uh, sub MT. We need uh, inelastic displacement M sub one and inelastic displacement M sub two. Well, inelastic displacement of either building one or two is found with this equation. And so we were given elastic displacement I like to do a little E. I know that the equations didn't show that, but I like to place the little E here to represent elastic versus inelastic. Inelastic is also can be referred to as your seismic design displacement, but the E for me just really solidifies in my head, oh, this is elastic displacement, which means it can the building can move and then go back to its original state without damage or permanent deformation. So that's the difference there versus e, uh, inelastic is that paper clip. You're pushing it beyond its, um, you know, its, its, its design capabilities. Damage is incurring. There's permanent displacement in the structure and it cannot go back to what it originally was. And uh, so we can kind of start from this point here. Well, displacement M sub one for building one is gonna equal, if you plug in our C sub D of five, uh, X E one over our importance, which we know is 1.0. All of that boils down, you know, just divided by one doesn't do anything. Gets you five displacement elastic one, inelastic displacement M two, 
will be the same thing. We can take this, we can take this, and now we can plug them in to our next equation. Our final solution, separation is going to equal the square root of 5 lambda xe1 squared plus the same thing. Now, there's two ways that you can do this. The one that I like to do that just has always sat better with me throughout my entire academic career is I like to plug in dummy variables for my variables to, and then compare the results um, to get my solution versus uh, like reducing but keeping everything in variable form. I just, I've never liked that way. I know, you know, roast me if you want, but that's just, that's just, that's just me. That's just what I like to do, dog. So I'm going to plug in a, a dummy elastic displacement uh, for my building one and two. And since we know that the elast elastic displacement for both buildings are identical, whatever value I plug in will be the same for both. So in this case, I'm going to put a uh, elastic displacement of one. Okay. That gets us five squared plus five squared over square root five square root two on the calculator. If you do your little equals approximate, that's 7.07. .07. So if you have an elastic displacement of one, you get, uh, you get an answer of seven elastic displacements for your required separation, which means that if we go back up here and notice the problem gives this in terms of how many elastic displacements, we can see that I would say the final answer would be D, seven times displacement. This separation requirement is, is a calculation that, that happens often, especially if you're a designer in a major city. Think about New York City. They have incredibly tall structures and everything's jam-packed into those, those avenues and those streets and all those blocks right up against one another. So this is something that is a common occurrence in the professional field that you're running calculations on and you're assuring uh, is, is thought through for a design. So don't understate this. Make sure that you know it. But hey, that's it here for today. Thank you for liking. Thank you for subscribing. And uh, until the next time, this is Rich with Team Kesteva. Peace.